Hello everybody and welcome to Hot Topics, where today we're going to be discussing the following hot topic. God saves all or God saves some? God saves all? That's called universalism. Or God saves some? That's called election. God saves all, or God saves some? What do you think? Well, today, we're going to be taking a look at all kinds of scriptures to see who exactly it is that God saves. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 1. And it's here in verse 21 that the angel told Joseph that Mary was pregnant, not by natural means, but rather by supernatural means, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 21, the angel said to Joseph, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save not all people, but rather his people from their sins. Do you see that? He will save his people from their sins. Who is he talking about here? Go to Matthew 25. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ. where he describes judgment, and he's the just judge. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another. As the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Well, who are the sheep? Verse 34. The king will say to those on his right, the sheep, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Who are the sheep? his people that he saved, the elect. And what does Jesus say to the sheep? Come into the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of time. Do you see it? But there's another group of people, those on the left, the goats. What happens to them? What does Jesus say to them? Hop over to verse 41. Then Jesus will also say to those on his left, the goats, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Doesn't sound like Jesus was teaching that he saves everyone. He saves some, his people, the sheep, the elect, the goats, eternal damnation. Again, verse 46, Jesus summarizes by saying that the goats will go to eternal punishment, but the righteous or the sheep to eternal life. Do you see it? And oh, by the way, go to John chapter 10. Let's carry on this theme of the sheep. John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life. For whom? Everyone? Nope. For the sheep. The elect. His people we came to save. 
the sheep. Down in verse 14, Jesus repeats this. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And Jesus makes it very clear over in verse 26 when he said to the hypocritical religious leaders who didn't believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah. He said to them, you do not believe because you're not my sheep. And then verse 27, he says, but my sheep. Well, they hear my voice. I know them in an intimate, loving way. They follow me and I give eternal life not to everyone, but to them, these sheep. And they will never perish. Do you see it? So, God saves all? Or God saves some? The angel told Joseph that they were to name the baby he and Mary, Jesus, why? He would save his people from their sins. Who are his people? His sheep, whom he lays down his life for, who he gives eternal life to. But not everybody is one of his sheep. You have the goats who don't believe that he's the Messiah, who reject him. And as a result, what will Jesus say to the goats? Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. Which, by the way, was prepared also for the devil and the demons. So it's very clear. In fact, just hop over to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. Another great verse. Verse 19, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows in an intimate, loving way those who are His. Which implies what? That not everyone is in that group of the Lord's. Right? Well, I know some of you may be thinking, well, Andrew, aren't there some places in, in Scripture where, you know, it talks about how God wants everyone to be saved and all that? Well, yeah, I would agree with that. And in fact, I'm going to show you a couple texts right now that those who teach that God saves everyone, universalism, I'm going to show you a couple of those texts that they use as their go-to verses. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. This is a big one for them. Uh, the Apostle Paul, let me just give you the context, was writing to a young pastor whom he had left there to pastor the church in Ephesus. The pastor's name was Timothy. Timothy was having a brutal time pastoring that church. And so in this letter, Paul was giving instructions to Timothy as to what he needed to do to clean up the church, to organize things in the church, to put things in order. In particular, here in chapter 2, Paul was giving Timothy instructions about the Lord's Day worship services. How were things supposed to function? Well, verse 1, Paul says to Timothy, first of all, Lord's Day service. You need to make entreaties, prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving on behalf of all men. In other words, Timothy is the pastor. You need to lead the congregation in praying for all men. Verse 2 including kings and all who are in authority. 
so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And oh, by the way, Timothy, praying for like this is good. Verse 3, and pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And here it is, verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There it is, the universalist will say. God wants everyone to be saved. And therefore, they say, God saves everyone. Well, on the surface, you may go, oh, kind of sounds like that. But we need to understand our context. Let's go back up to verse 1. You need to understand, the word all in the Greek, pan, uh, can mean all, meaning every person, but it also can mean all, all kinds of people, depending on the context. It's the same thing in the English, right? Well, let's take a look at the context here and let's see what Paul actually was saying to Timothy. Verse 1, first of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. In this context, was Timothy to lead the congregation in praying for absolutely every human who was living on the earth at that time? No. First of all, Timothy didn't know everybody, right? <laughs> So in the context, he's not saying pray for all, meaning every single person, but rather pray for all kinds of people, including, verse 2, kings and all or all kinds who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life and all godliness and dignity. Now, that makes sense. That's what we do at our Lord's Day services. I lead the congregation in, in pastoral prayer where we pray not just for ourselves in the congregation, but rather we also pray for all kinds of people. We pray for those who are in positions of authority in our government national level, state level, and local level. Do I know the name of every single person? No. We pray for all kinds of people. We pray for Republicans. We pray for Democrats, that the Lord would save them. We pray for God's wisdom upon them, God's safety upon them, so that we as citizens in this country can live quiet and, and peaceful lives of godliness. In the context here, Paul wasn't saying to Timothy, you need to pray for absolutely all or every person living on the face of the earth. First of all, again, Timothy didn't know every person. And even if he did, how long do you think that worship service would take, <laughs> right? Fast forward to our time, over 7 billion people on the earth. If I was required as a pastor to pray for every single person, first of all, how would I know them? And second of all, church service would be, what, <laughs> several weeks, if not months. So it's clear in the context, all here means all kinds of people, right? Back up to verse 1. Again, let's just repeat this. Paul says to Timothy, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all or all kinds of men, for kings and all who are in authority, all kinds of people, so that we as believers may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity, verses 3 and 4. This is good and pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. When God's people, when they're gathered on the Lord's day in the Lord's house, when they pray, not just simply for themselves, but their prayers are outward centered, praying for all kinds of people, people in their families, people in the community, 
people in various different positions of authority, praying for all kinds of people. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Verse 4, who desires all men to be saved or all kinds of people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What do you think? Based on the context. All kinds of people, right? And so that's why context is key here. God wants all kinds of people to be saved. Not just Jews, not just Gentiles, not just people with this skin color or that skin color. He wants all kinds of people to be saved. All kinds of people, various different socioeconomic uh, statuses, educational backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, of course. That's why we pray for all kinds of people, because God wants all kinds of people to be saved, right? Now, it is true that God's will of disposition is that he's a good God, a loving God, a kind God, and that God does not take pleasure and people going to hell. We know that. Go to Ezekiel chapter 18. We see that very clearly when God was rebuking the Israelites, telling them to repent so they will not face eternal judgment. Look what God said to, to, to his people. In verse 23, God says, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? No, God says, rather, I want to see that that person turns from his ways and lives. God's a good God. He hopped down to verse 31. He says to his people, cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For God said, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies. Therefore, repent and live. God's will of disposition is that he's a loving God. He doesn't find joy in people suffering eternal damnation. That's why God commands people, repent, turn from your ways, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be saved. But what do people do? They reject God. They disobey God. They mock God. They blaspheme God. They hate God. Just like most in the nation of Israel at that time. God said, whoa, I don't find pleasure that you're going to suffer eternally. That's why God says, repent and live. But most of them didn't. Did God save them? No. Because yes, God is a loving God. He is a kind God. He does not take pleasure in the death of people. But he's also a just God, perfectly holy and righteous, and he must punish sin. And the punishment for sin is eternal damnation. That's why God commands people to repent and to place their faith and trust in the only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But, unfortunately, people don't. Does God just kind of say, well, let me just forget that I'm just. Let me just forget that I'm holy. And let me just 
ignore everybody's sins, everybody's rebellion, and let me just save everybody. No. Remember, Jesus saves his people, the elect, from their sins. Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. His sheep, who he will say to on that day, enter into the eternal kingdom. But the goats, who wanted nothing to do with Jesus, what's he going to say to them? Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which also will have in there the devil and the demon. God saves all, or God saves some? God saves some. In fact, just hop over to 1 Corinthians 15, another text that universalists like to use, similar to 1, Corinthians, or 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's, again, just look at the context. Uh, we read here in verses 21 and 22, the Apostle Paul said that, For since by a man, Adam, came death, sin came into the world through Adam, and the consequences of sin, death. For since by a man, Adam, came death, by a man, the perfect God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, also came the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22, For as in Adam all die so also in Christ all will be made alive. Is Paul saying that Christ saves everyone? No. Who are the all that will be made alive? End of verse 23. Those who are Christ's at his coming. Do you see it? His sheep, right? All who are in Adam will die, eternal damnation. But all who are Christ's will be made alive. Will receive new glorified resurrected bodies. Right? Those who are His. The sheep. And so, context again is so important. As we saw in 1 Timothy 2. When Paul was talking about God desires all to be saved. Yes, God's will of disposition is he does not take pleasure in the death of anyone. But nevertheless, in that context, the all are all kinds of people. God desires all kinds of people to be saved. That's why the church needs to pray for all kinds of people. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, all will be made alive in Christ. Who are the all? Those who are his at his coming. Make sense? Hop over to Mark chapter 10. Let me just show you a couple more here. Mark chapter 10. Jesus' disciples were having a, a big argument, jealous, envy. They were trying to vie for top positions, and Jesus had to deal with, with that. And then Jesus said in verse 45 to them, For even the Son of Man, referring to himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for everyone? No, for many. Who are the many? The sheep. In fact, Jesus really is echoing the words here when he says that he, gave, he came to give his life as a ransom for many, echoing the words of Isaiah 53. Let's just go there real quick. Isaiah 53, written 700 years before the birth of Christ, talking about the coming Messiah. Middle of verse 12, who would pour out himself to death. He would be numbered with the transgressors. He himself would bear the sin of many, the sheep, and would intercede for the transgressors. Do you see it? And so, our hot topic question, God saves all or God saves some? What's the answer? 
God saves some. Who are the some? His sheep, the elect, those who are his. And so as I conclude, here's my big question. Are you one of his sheep? Or are you one of the goats? One of his sheep? You hear his voice through the scriptures? You follow him in humble obedience? Because he has given you the free gift of eternal life. Is that you? Or are you one of the goats? who want nothing to do with Christ, who refuse to repent of your sins and to place your faith and trust in Christ alone. Is that you? God doesn't save everyone. He saves some. Those who truly repent of their sins, those who truly cry out to Jesus, begging him, for mercy and grace. Those who place their faith and trust in Christ alone for the free gift of eternal life. That, or I should say, yeah, that type of person is a person who is saved. The rest? Damned. And so, I hope, I pray, that you know what Christ will say to you on Judgment Day. I hope and pray that you know on that day that you're truly one of his saved sheep. Because you do not want to be one of the cursed goats. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those who believe in him will have the free gift of eternal life and will not be condemned. Think about where you are right now. God doesn't save all. God saves some. And Jesus Christ is the one and only Savior. Amen.